please welcome Meg Wolitzer. I grew up on Long Island in the town of Syosset, which some of you may know by its Native American name, Exit 43. <laughs> but the summer I turned 15, which also happened to be the summer that Richard Nixon resigned, I was sent to a camp in the Berkshires, and it changed my life. I'd been to summer camp before, but at those other camps, we made lanyards, and we had really aggressive color war, and we sang those corny camp songs, make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other gold. Sound advice. But at this camp, we had Mozart requiems in the morning, and we did a lot of batik. Now, there's a word you don't get a chance to use in a sentence very often, batik. And we also acted in experimental plays in which invariably someone was supposed to go mad on stage and go running out through the audience. I loved it there. I wanted to act more than anything that summer, and I'd been studying my favorite actresses all year. I'd been looking really closely at their style. I'd been looking at Elizabeth Montgomery and her stirring portrayal of Samantha Stevens. <laughs> Karen Valentine in Room 222. And perhaps the most moving of all, Susan Day as Laurie Partridge. But here's the thing, when I got to camp and I stood up on stage, I, this little Jewish girl from Long Island, talked in a voice that I can only describe as my Katherine Hepburn voice. Mother, where are you? Where are you, mother? I don't know where it came from. It's sort of the acting equivalent of the poetry voice. You know what I'm talking about? I am a woman who lives in Red Hook. Here are the keys to my apartment. <laughs> yes. But there was one girl at camp who was really, really good. Her name was Martha, and she had long brown hair with little wildflowers sprinkled in it, and she wore long sun summer dresses, and whenever she spoke, little woodland animals gathered at her feet. <laughs> and songbirds came down and sat on her shoulders and tilted their heads to listen. At the end of the summer, we were given yearbooks, and all these boys wrote in Martha's yearbook, I never told you this, but I was in love with you all summer. And those same boys wrote in my yearbook, you're so funny. <laughs> now, the campers weren't the only ones to love Martha. Our acting teacher did too. She was this really distinguished woman who taught theater in Greenwich Village and had taught some of the great legends. And she sort of looked like Isaac Dennison's stunt double. And when Martha got up to do a monologue, Cora, that was her name, Cora would say, oh, Martha, that was so wonderful, the way you did that Edward Albee monologue. In fact, I'm gonna call Ed tonight and tell him how good you were. <laughs> Martha would say, thank you, Cora. And the little birds would say, thank you, Cora. <laughs> but when I got up to act, no matter what I did, I could not please this woman. I think she tried to help me, but I was all over the place. And she would say, Meg Wallitzer, discipline yourself. Pipe down, be still, all these things. I couldn't do any of them. And one day in class, we were doing an improv. And I think we were supposed to be shell-shocked World War I soldiers. <laughs> And I was laughing and laughing. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, Meg Wallitzer, you are being ridiculous. Ridiculous. This was not the same as being funny. I was so ashamed. The heat rose to my face. And all I could do was keep laughing. It was horrible. And she said, go, just go. And she sent me off and I staggered out onto the lawn, really kind of like a shell-shocked World War I soldier. <laughs> and I sat down on the hill and I kept laughing. 
what was wrong with me? I was such a freak that I could not stop laughing. None of the other kids would have done that. I loved these kids. They were so interesting. We talked about music and French films and art, and we even talked about sex. Now Martha, who had become my really good friend, she and I had been sitting on that hill just the day before, and I was talking to her sort of about our boyfriends back at home. Now I had a boyfriend who, I don't know, our relationship was a little bit stormy. He sort of looked like, he was going for a Cat Stevens look, but it doesn't really work when you have a retainer. He also had a tendency to refer to me as milady. <laughs> but Martha and her boyfriend, I pictured them being so sophisticated, wearing matching berets and sort of passing a galois cigarette back and forth. And I wanted to know how they did it and what their relationship was like. And I said to her, like, like when you're with your boyfriend, how far do you go? I realize I sound like one of the little rascals. Um, and she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, like, do you give him a blowjob? And she looked at me and she said, oh, Meg, dear Meg, we call it making love. <laughs> and I realized that that was my problem in acting class. I was giving blowjobs and everyone else was making love. <laughs> But I wasn't the only one asked to leave the class. Sometimes Cora would look at Martha and say, you look a little peaked, a little tired. That improv exercise wore you out a little bit. Would you like to go rest? And Martha would say, well, I am a little tired, Cora. And Cora said, why don't you go lie down in my bed? Now, Cora had a bed in the mansion at the summer camp, and it was one of those huge four-poster beds that looked like the kind of bed that Norma Desmond would have slept in in Sunset Boulevard and it had crusty velvet blankets. I wanted more than anything for an acting teacher to say, you look tired, go lie down in my bed. I wanted to lie in that bed and make love with a boy in my acting class and turn to each other and recite, I don't know, Samuel Beckett lines. I can't go on, I'll go on. <laughs> but one day, one day I'd been banished from class and told to go think about being serious, and Martha had been sent off to go lie down in Cora's bed, and there I was wandering despondently around the camp, and it was totally quiet. All I could hear in the distance was a little bit of oboe. I knew kids were doing interpretive dance or doing jazz hands, <laughs> and something brought me to the mansion. I wanted to talk to Martha. She was my friend. I wanted to see her, and I went up the stairs. It was totally silent. And there in Cora's gigantic bed, Martha was sleeping. She was fast asleep. And I stood over her, and I looked down, and I thought about, you know, here is this girl. She's so different from me. I was never going to be that girl. I was never going to be the girl who was asked to lie in this bed. That wasn't me. And I realized that the reason I'd been laughing so much in class was because I was having an incredible time this summer. I was free and I was expressive. It was the first time I think it ever felt that way. And I looked at Martha and I said, get up. And she sort of rose up from a deep sleep like a little mermaid, kind of <laughs> coming up from a warm pocket of amniotic seawater. <laughs> and she said, what, what? And I said, come on, let's go outside. And she said, okay. And together we went outside and we went and we sat on our hill and we talked. I was good at that. There was a lot that I wanted to say. In fact, I'd begun keeping a diary that summer. And at first, I wrote so much in it because everything was happening. But after a while, I was so busy that I had no time to write in the diary. But I felt a little worried because what if I became really famous one day and they wanted to publish my diaries? I'd be sort of like a lesser known member of the Bloomsbury Circle, the Syosset set. So I went back to my diary, and on all the empty pages, I wrote, nothing happened. <laughs> nothing happened. <laughs> but a lot, a lot was happening that summer, and not just in me, but in the world. On August 9th, we were all called into the Charles Ives room, where a television set was wheeled in, and we watched as Richard Nixon was lifted like a rotting piece of lawn furniture. 
everything was changing. This took place 40 years ago, exactly this summer. Cora, the acting teacher, is long dead. Richard Nixon is long dead. I still miss the guy. Martha and I actually remain best friends to this day. And we're totally different from each other. She's still chic and lovely, and I'm still funny or maybe ridiculous, like tonight, I don't know. <laughs> and I really think about, you know, the thing is, it's really sort of that, what happened that summer? The world is always trying to tell you what you're not. And it's really up to you to say what you are. All the things, every single thing that Cora disliked about me, my rubishness, my silliness, the way I put myself out there again and again, turned out to be the things that I feel most tender about in myself. Thank you. Meg Wallitzer!